as far back as I can remember, Martin Scorsese has always been considered to be one of the greatest directors of all time, but it wasn't always the case. The 70s had been good to Scorsese, the critical and commercial success of Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Taxi Driver and Raging Bull had put Scorsese's name on the scoreboard and helped him weather the disappointment of New York, New York. As Scorsese entered the 1980s, it was a different story altogether, and his reputation was on thin ice. So let's start at the start. Scorsese first emerged onto the scene in the early 70s as part of the New Hollywood, alongside contemporaries such as Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma and William Friedkin, to name just a few. This young breed of cinematic auteurs changed the face of Hollywood cinema with singular visions that not only captured the imagination of the young post-counterculture audience, but also pushed the boundaries of the cinematic form by incorporating the influence of European and world cinema, creating a so-called American New Wave. At this time in movie history, it was the director, not the marketplace, that dictated cinema. Ironically, the New Hollywood era would end up a victim of its own success. Spielberg's Jaws and George Lucas' Star Wars would usher in the era of the summer blockbuster and whet the studio's appetite for bigger, crowd-pleasers with merchandising opportunities. As the power of the auteurs grew, riskier films with bigger budgets would be greenlit, proving to be big gambles that didn't always pay off. The final nail in the coffin came in the form of the Deer Hunter director Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate from 1980, which was considered to be an extravagant and self-indulgent flop. This created a hostile environment for director-led material in the 80s, and studios began to invest in spectacles and sequels. So, back to the 80s. With many of the bright talents of the new Hollywood beginning to fade, Scorsese also found himself in a similar position. It was only Spielberg who seemed to reign supreme. Scorsese kept busy with small projects such as The King of Comedy, After Hours and The Colour of Money. All three were well-directed films, but paled in comparison to his past glories. When his controversial passion project, The Last Temptation of Christ, also failed to connect with audiences, it seems that it was a critical moment in Scorsese's career to define himself yet again. Scorsese back then, was not the same Scorsese we revere unquestionably right now. Looking back, I wonder if Taxi Driver and Raging Bull would have been enough to give Scorsese a lasting legacy. Friedkin and De Palma had a handful of hits respectively, but never managed to recapture their glory days, relegating them to cult status. You would think the directors of The Exorcist and Scarface would still capture the imagination of current cinephiles, but it was Scorsese who elevated himself into mythic status, and that was because of Goodfellas. Based on the book Wise Guy by Nicholas Pileggi, Scorsese entered the 90s with a bang. Goodfellas is a virtuoso piece of filmmaking that rewrote the book when it comes to the visual language and grammar of cinema. Think Maury tells his wife everything. Maury, yeah? That's when I knew Jimmy was gonna whack Maury. That's how it happens. That's how fast it takes for a guy to get whacked. No, Jimmy's a nut job. He talks to everybody. Scorsese sealed his reputation, not only as one of cinema's most innovative and exciting directors, but he also confirmed his place as a master of the gangster genre. It's easy to take for granted that this was not always the case, as Scorsese, for the last 30 years, has become synonymous with the genre, but it's important to point out that up until Goodfellas, he had only made one gangster film, and that was Mean Streets, 17 years earlier. It was Goodfellas that made Scorsese. Through some quirk of fate, 1990 saw a revival of the gangster film. Perhaps it was the success of Brian De Palma's The Untouchables that brought the genre back into fashion. In 1990, we had Miller's Crossing, King of New York, and The Godfather Part Three. But it's safe to say that they were all left in the shadow of Goodfellas. They were no match for Scorsese's bold approach. Goodfellas did something unique. It showed the inner workings of the mafia from the low levels, from the foot soldier's perspective, as opposed to the perspective of the Dons. Unlike the stately and elegant Godfather movies, Goodfellas is an exhilarating ride through 30 years of the Mafia, told by an undisciplined chancellor called Henry Hill, played by Ray Liotta. If we were to compare it to The Godfather, it would be like we were following Fredo instead of Michael. However, where The Godfather plays out like an operatic tragedy, Goodfellas is more like a rock and roll fueled frenzy. The characters in Goodfellas are portrayed as very down-to-earth, working people. The glamour is replaced with tacky materialism and provides the perfect vehicle to explore the seductive nature of criminality as some kind of shorthand to achieve the American dream. 
Scorsese. Scorsese does not judge his characters. Instead, he uses an almost documentary-like approach that's exquisitely detailed to create empathy for Henry Hill and his accomplices. Big old hoof. The hoof got caught in the grill. Oh. I, gotta, I gotta hack it off. Ooh. Come on, it's a sin. You're gonna leave it there, you know. Even before I first wandered into the cab stand for an after-school job, I knew I wanted to be a part of them. It was there that I knew that I belonged. And to me, it meant being somebody in a neighborhood that was full of nobodies. Henry Hill is our gateway into the secretive world of the mob. We follow him from childhood as he hero worships the mob from afar. And once he joins, we slowly witness his seduction. The holy trinity of the characters around Henry not only represent the three pillars of the mob, but they also represent Henry's desires. Joe Pesci's Tommy is violence and strength. Robert De Niro's Jimmy is money and wealth. And Paul Savino's Mafia Don Paulie represents power. Henry's conflict to juggle these influences are what ultimately leads to his demise. He's constantly pushing the boundaries, going not only behind his wife's back, but eventually behind the back of Paulie and breaking the strict codes of the Mafia. Just stay away from the garbage, you know what I mean? Paulie, I'm not you talking mean? about what you did inside. You did what you had to do. I'm talking about now. From now, here, and now. Paulie, why would I want to get into that? Don't I, make a I'm jerk not... out of me. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Scorsese clearly brought everything in his arsenal to Goodfellas. The film combines documentary realism with a very kinetic camera. It seems his work in the 80s proved to be a great testing ground for moving the camera and staging long takes. The long takes are pivotal at expressing the immersion of Henry and the audience into the world of organised crime. In one long take, the camera drifts over the faces of various mob members as Henry's narration tells us their names. It's like a rogues gallery and we're brought into this exclusive world and, in an inventive visual twist, the shot changes from point of view to a master shot for the scene as Henry enters. The second is arguably the most discussed and most referenced shot in Scorsese's career, and that's the long take which follows Henry and Karen into the Copa. It's an epic long take that tracks them from outside the club all the way inside the nightclub, right next to the stage. It's a beautifully visual way to not only demonstrate Henry's power and importance, but it also shows us how Karen, a complete outsider to the criminal world, is utterly seduced by it. What do you do? I'm in construction. Henry's wife, Karen, is a great surrogate for the audience. Her seduction and acceptance of Henry's criminality reflects ours as the audience. When Henry defends her against the neighbor who assaults her, she's aroused by the power. I know there are women like my best friends who would have gotten out of there the minute their boyfriend gave them a gun to hide. But I didn't. I gotta admit the truth, it turned me on. Scorsese uses several scenes and techniques to express how she's not only seduced, but overwhelmed by this new world she's entering. The wedding scene in particular is dizzying, not only through the moving camera, but also the rapid cutting that shows Karen's anxiety as the gift envelopes containing money are given to them. The bag. The bag. What? what the bag? bag. The bag with all the envelopes in it. All the money. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Nobody's gonna steal that here. The other scene is when Karen meets the mob wives and is overwhelmed by their large personalities and foul-mouthed gossip. Scorsese again deploys rapid editing to convey Karen's conflict as she struggles to fit in. Much like the audience, she's dizzied by the pace. I don't know if I could live like that! As a master of the moving camera, Scorsese uses camera movement in very expressive ways in order to convey the emotions within their scenes. This is a signature in all of his movies. In Goodfellas, the first half is the rise of Henry and his crew. It's seductive and glamorous. The camera is elegant, but it also moves rapidly to reflect the excitement of planning a heist. Once Henry begins cheating, lying and doing drugs, we see the editing style and camera movement become more abrupt and jarring. The clear turning point into the descent, however, is after the murder of Billy Bats. Scorsese begins to create a feeling of uncertainty. Once Henry and his gang successfully pull off the Lufthansa heist, we again have fluidity of the camera, suggesting that things are on the up. However, this jubilance is short-lived. In the show-stopping sequence, set to Layla by Derek and the Dominoes, where we see all the loose ends tied up, the camera glides through the air from location to location, from death to death. Henry and Jimmy are happy, but this moment of optimism doesn't last long once they find out Tommy has been killed in revenge for killing Billy Bats. 
This opens the last virtuoso sequence of the movie, a 15 minute sequence of drug fueled paranoia where the camera crashes into faces, zooms into helicopters and generally creates a sense of mayhem. Legend has it that the cameras were moved so fast they were pushed off the rails of the tracks in order to create the whirlwind of Henry's insane day. The sequence is astonishing in its use of music cues and truncation of time leading to Henry's eventual arrest. Any problems, he goes to Pauly. Trouble with the bill, he can go to Pauly. Trouble with the cops, deliveries, Tommy, he can call Pauly. But now the guy's gotta come up with Pauly's money every week, no matter what. Business bad, fuck you, pay me. Oh, you had a fire? Fuck you, pay me. Place got hit by lightning, huh? Fuck you, pay me. Goodfellas is so influential as a movie, it's almost easy to take it for granted. With the exception of perhaps Kubrick with a clockwork orange and full metal jacket, voiceover just hadn't been used in such a freewheeling way before. Scorsese took influence from Francois Truffaut's Jules Légime in his approach to voiceover. It's the glue that holds the film together. Ray Liotta's voice is just so iconic now, just so memorable. And now it's all over. And this defiant voiceover style has been used again and again, as well as the voiceover, the long tracking shots and freeze frames can be seen in recent movies such as Boogie Nights, Fight Club, Train Spotting, Blow, Lord of War, War Dogs, and American Hustle, to name but a few. They all owe a huge debt to Goodfellas. The most notable influence on modern movies is also the structure. Many movies since Goodfellas use the technique of starting the story in the middle and then cutting back to the beginning. It simply wasn't a convention until Scorsese did it. The only examples that come to mind that come close of Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity and Sunset Boulevard, but even those start at the end and work backwards. As mentioned, it was Goodfellas that made Scorsese. It became a definitive work. It was not only a culmination of what he had done before, but also a benchmark for what would come after. Even though he has deviated from the gangster genre with varying levels of success, his signature style is visible in works ranging from The Age of Innocence, Kunden, Gangs of New York, and Wolf of Wall Street. But recently, with the release of The Irishman, we see the connective tissue of his gangster films. With Casino, he took the themes and techniques of Goodfellas to new heights to show the decadence and excess to an infinite degree. With The Irishman, he reappraised and rewrote the myths. 30 years after Goodfellas and 15 years since Casino, Scorsese gave audiences what they'd been waiting for, another gangster epic. As much as his work with Leonardo DiCaprio resulted in some interesting work, again, it felt like his output in the 80s, well put together, but not quite hitting the mark. The Irishman gave us not only the genre we love from its master, but it also brought back the faces we love. Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and the godfather himself, Al Pacino, not to mention Harvey Keitel. Scorsese created the ultimate gangster film, another entry into the franchise that Scorsese's legacy has become. However, The Irishman is not just another entry into the gangster genre, it's most likely to be the last movie of its kind. It's an ode to the acting legends of the new Hollywood and to the unique brand of influential cinema that Scorsese has created in collaboration with them. There's no question that Scorsese's contribution and legacy will endure as long as cinema does. He won't fade into anonymity like Henry Hill. If Scorsese rewrote the book of cinema with Goodfellas, then in many ways, The Irishman could be seen as its final chapter. So that's my take on Goodfellas. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Funny how? I mean, what's funny about it?